It's something we all do, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But for some people, the basic function of breathing puts them at one of the highest risks in the country for developing cancer. We're scared to death for our community just as a whole. Scared to death because they're breathing air with toxic chemical emissions. If we got this stuff in the air and we're all breathing it, what, what's going to happen, you know? And we found the government agencies tasked with protecting people knew about the risk for nearly two years before ever saying a word. They also refused to speak with us about the issues for months, running from our cameras. Are they going to do an interview with us? And avoiding questions. Are you willing to let us maybe talk with Secretary Ward? We finally tracked them down at a meeting and got our chance to ask about neighbors' concerns. But since then, we found new data showing the problem has worsened and the state still not alerting residents to the danger. You know, I feel like Horton hears a who very often and we're just crying out and nobody can hear us. We call this series Cancer Causing Chemicals, but it's about more than that. It's about a government agency that failed to act. We're scared to death. We're scared to death for our community just as a whole. Kathy Ferguson's home sits on the hill just above the Union Carbide Institute facility, a facility the EPA says releases ethylene oxide known as ETO, a colorless, odorless gas that can cause cancer. Kathy is among more than 12,000 people who live in an area the EPA identified in August 2018 as having a potentially elevated cancer risk from ETO admissions. By March 2020, the EPA declared that same area a hot spot, meaning there's a likelihood that 101 million people would develop cancer if they breathe air containing the same amount of air pollutant every day for 70 years. But near this plant and institute, that risk is actually more than three times higher, with 335 in a million people who could develop cancer. When they say it's a carcinogen, like that's the highest level that you can get. Like, you know, it's not like, um, you know, stage one or stage two. Or, like, it's literally a cancer causing agent. In January 2020, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection sent a letter to the EPA asking the agency to review the current standards to further reduce admissions of ETO. Two months later, the area was declared a hot spot, but it wasn't until August of 2021, nearly a year and a half later, when the DEP sent out a press release finally notifying the public of the potential danger. The agency's spokesperson, Terry Fletcher, answered a few of our questions over the phone the day that he sent out the release. Working with community leaders um, to, to try and gather the most updated and most recent information that, that we can gather. Um, and that way we can do more uh, testing, we can do more modeling. Then in September, the DEP held a virtual meeting to answer questions from community members. Since then, we've been collecting data and asking questions to see what's actually being done to protect these people, but we haven't been able to get any answers. This is Terry Fletcher, Acting Communications Director for the West Virginia DEP. I'm currently away from my desk. The best way to reach me is through my email at terry.a.fletcher at wv.gov. That's the message I got every single time I reached out to the DEP. Not a single one of my calls were picked up. Hi Terry, this is Brendan Tierney with WSAZ News Channel 3. Hi Terry, this is Brendan Tierney with Hi Terry, this is Brendan Tierney with WSAZ. Still trying to get in touch with you. I was giving you a call to follow up and none of my calls or voicemails were returned. At the same time, I started sending emails requesting an interview like Fletcher's voicemail message instructed. We also asked for the DEP's communications with the EPA and its communications with the Union Carbide Plant. In our initial email on January 13th, Fletcher responded a day later saying he was working on a response and should quote, have something to you next week. But to date, we still have not received the information we requested and our repeated requests for an interview were either told no one was available or Fletcher said he would answer our questions only via email. So I went to the DEP headquarters in Charleston 
in hopes of finally getting some answers. My name is Brendan Tierney. I'm a reporter with WSAZ News Channel 3. Um, we've been trying for about a month to get in touch with um, Terry Fletcher with the DEP or Secretary Ward. We were hoping to catch him today. The receptionist said that she had to call upstairs and see who was available and told us to take a seat. After about five minutes of waiting, we were told that neither of them were in the office that day and there was no one else from the DEP who was allowed to speak with us. Terry's supposed to be getting in contact with you and he said that he would, uh, he would definitely get a hold of you and schedule that appointment. Well, we've been trying for a month now to schedule one and he hasn't been able to get one for us. That's what we were hoping to do today. Yeah, he's not here today. He's not here today? Would he be in later this afternoon? I have no way of knowing. Okay. I just know that uh, the secretary upstairs went around looking and they're not here. Are we able to talk with her up there? Uh-uh, she's not allowed to speak to the news. Okay, is there anyone here who can today? No? Okay, um, when can I expect to hear back from Terry? Honestly, I have no clue. You don't know when? Okay, um, so it's just keep waiting? Yeah, I'm sorry. So we left with the promise that we would get an interview, but less than five hours later, Terry Fletcher emailed me saying, quote, as I've mentioned previously, the WVDEP will not be providing an interview at this time, but if you have additional questions, we will address them via email. He also said for future interview requests, please submit a formal request through me and confirm the date, time, and location of the interview before showing up to the WVDEP facilities and do not do so unannounced. <laughs> Remember back on January 13th? That's when I started calling. I was just giving you a call to follow up with my voicemail from earlier this morning as well as the email I has sent you because I haven't heard back quite yet. And emailing, formally requesting an interview through Fletcher. And we also want to point out the DEP headquarters is a public, taxpayer-funded building that anyone is allowed to enter. Well, Fletcher declined to talk with us on camera for this story. He kept directing us to this website that the DEP created about ETO admissions. So we went to that website and found this section called What is the DEP doing to address concerns of ETO? One of the first things listed on there is that the DEP asked the DHHR to do an assessment of the cancer registry in the areas near these plants. And according to the website, it found that there is not an elevated level of cancer due to ETO. So we asked the DHHR for that assessment. A spokesperson confirms the assessment was completed, but says no formal report exists. And while we're working to get answers to these questions, people that live near the Institute plant say they feel ignored and forgotten by the agencies who are supposed to keep them safe. You know, I feel like Horton hears a who very often and we're just crying out and nobody can hear us. We did reach out to Union Carbide multiple times requesting an interview, but those requests were denied. We do want to point out that both Union Carbide facilities are operating within their permits, meaning they aren't violating any state or federal standards regarding ethylene oxide emissions. Now, the EPA isn't set to review or make any changes to those standards until the year 2024. But they did speak with us about what could be done in the meantime to address any concerns from their data. We're talking about a toxic that if it affects the community, and there are uh, disadvantaged communities that are vulnerable, um, that are overburdened. Complying with a regulation doesn't necessarily mean that is sufficient enough. We could possibly go in there and uh, negotiate to try, you know, with the state to negotiate for any additional uh, work practices. We'll hear more from the EPA later on and get their thoughts on the risks to neighbors. We do want to point out we tried for about a month before our investigation aired to speak with someone at the state level at the Department of Environmental Protection, but our requests were denied. But we kept trying and even went to the governor, hoping to get answers. After our initial story aired, we sent a link to our investigation to Terry Fletcher's boss, DEP Cabinet Secretary Harold Ward, once again asking for an interview. Ward never responded to us, but I did get an email from Communications Director Terry Fletcher 48 hours later that said Ward forwarded him my message and quote, the WVDEP will not be providing an interview at this time on this subject as I have stated previously to you, and went on to say, quote, 
all the information the agency has on this issue has been provided. But wait a minute. Back on January 19th, we asked for all communications between the DEP and the EPA, as well as all communications between the DEP and Union Carbide. At the time, we were told they were working on a response and should have something to you by next week. That was nearly a month ago. To date, we have received zero documents. So we took this issue to the DEP secretary's boss, Governor Jim Justice. Hello, everyone. It's uh, February the 17th. We asked Governor Justice for an interview, but never got a response. So we went to the West Virginia Capitol to talk with the governor after his scheduled virtual COVID-19 press briefing. We were hoping to talk to you about some... He's doing great work. Are they going to do an interview with us? I really frankly don't know. Because there's about 12,000 people in this area that are being exposed to these cancer-causing chemicals. Governor, are you in touch with the EPA at all? We're in touch with everybody. What are you doing to protect people in these areas? The DEP does great work, man. As Governor Justice drove away without answering our questions, we went back inside and tried to ask the communications staff if anyone else was willing to talk about the issue. Hey, Jordan, are you willing to let us maybe talk with Secretary Ward? Or anyone else? Clearly, they weren't interested in talking to us. But we did send our investigations to our U.S. and state senators who represent those areas. Each of them responded to us. Some even went on camera, including U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. I mean, you know, transparency and basically communication is the most, most important thing that we can do in the public sector. If you're a public servant, let the public know what's going on. If you don't know something, let them know you're working on it. If you do know something, tell them the good, bad, and, and, and the ugly, if you will. Coming up, just days after our investigations air, the head of the DEP speaks out for the first time, but not to our cameras. The social media video the agency posted in an effort to control the narrative. And months later, we finally get our chance to ask the question on everyone's mind. Do you think it's safe for people to live around these plants? Plus, new data, new dangers, but once again, no warning to neighbors. How our phone calls to the DEP sent them scrambling to update their website. We'll show you the important information they left out. A toxic chemical in the air, thousands breathe. When they say it's a carcinogen, like that's the highest level that you can get. EPA data shows this community in our region among the highest in the country for cancer risk. And the state agency that knew about it kept quiet for nearly two years. We tried to talk to that agency time and time again. Trying for about a month to get in touch with um, Terry Fletcher with the DEP or Secretary Ward. They're not available today. But for Three months, months we were shut out. out, leaving neighbors worried. Do you think the state of West Virginia and the EPA is doing enough to protect the environment and protect people that live here? I don't think so. I don't think so. We call this series Cancer Causing Chemicals. It's one we've been working on for years. So how did we get here? We obtained emails from as far back as November 2019 between the EPA and the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, referring to these areas around these two plants in Institute and South Charleston as hotspots for emissions of ethylene oxide or ETO. It's a colorless, odorless gas that can cause cancer. Fast forward nearly two years later to August 2021. The DEP sends out its first press release about the elevated risk and weeks later holds a virtual public meeting. That brings us to February 2022 when we started airing our investigations, but no one from the state would talk to us. Our first story aired late on a Sunday night 
And just days later, the DEP went on the defense in a social media video and press release. Friday afternoon, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection sent out a press release addressing our investigation and even posted a video with Cabinet Secretary Harold Ward. Hello, I'm Harold Ward, Cabinet Secretary for the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. That's the same person we've been trying to get an interview with for more than a month. Remember, we started by calling his communications director. Hi, Terry. This is Brendan Tierney with WSAZ News Channel 3. Hi, Terry. This is Brendan Tierney. With Hi, Terry. This is Brendan Tierney with WSAZ. Still trying to get in touch with you. And emailing weeks ago. We even went to his office in hopes of sitting down with him. They're not available today. Uh, no, they're not here. When that didn't work, we went to Secretary Ward's boss, Governor Jim Justice, on Thursday. The DP does great work, man. Clearly, they weren't interested in talking with us, but just 24 hours later, Ward appears in a video on the DEP's social media account. In the video, Ward says he wanted to reiterate the steps the agency has taken on this issue. Over the past several months, the DEP has continued to engage with interested parties by participating in both the Institute and South Charleston Community Advisory Panel meetings and providing updates on ethylene oxide in quarterly town hall meetings between citizens and the agency's environmental advocates. You heard Secretary Ward say in that social media video that they had been providing quarterly updates in town halls with citizens. But at that point, the agency had only held one virtual public meeting you see here, despite knowing about the risk years earlier. The first in-person meeting wouldn't happen until about a month after our initial investigations aired here at this rec center between the hotspot areas. That's where we finally got our chance to speak with the agency. These areas in Kanawha County were declared hotspots by the EPA in 2020. You guys waited until August of 2021 to send out a press release notifying the public about it. Why? Uh, actually, we sent out a press release in 2019. That didn't say anything about Kanawha County or these plans. Right. The, 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 uh, the, the press release mentioned that the, um, you know, it was outlining the, the new cancer risk associated with ethylene oxide. Um, and so we were trying to give the folks, uh, give people uh, uh, what we had at the time, the information we had at the time. However, we found the agency did not release all of the information it had at the time. Through a Freedom of Information Act request we filed with the DEP, we found multiple emails from 2019 that show the agency knew about the new data and potentially elevated cancer risk in these communities. This email dated November 18th, 2019 from the DEP to the plants refers to them as, quote, the hotspot facilities for ethylene oxide admissions identified by EPA. So you feel like the people in these areas were notified at the right time, even though that original press release didn't say anything about these areas? The the initial press release, um, again, was just to outline the new information that we had about ethylene oxide. But that's not true. This is a copy of the release from 2019. It only says West Virginia is among the top seven states for ETO admissions. It never mentions the word cancer or any risk associated with the chemical. It also never lists any specific locations, despite those emails we told you about that refer to the Institute and South Charleston plants as hotspot facilities. After our initial stories aired, the DEP sent out another release on February 18th, 2022, attempting to call our reporting into question. It includes a line that reads, the WVDEP is not aware of the EPA declaring any of the areas within Canal County as a hotspot. But remember those emails from 2019? You sent out a press release saying that you were not aware these areas were declared hotspots. But as far back as 2019, some of your head scientists were saying that these areas were hotspots. Why is that? I'm not aware of uh, EPA or anyone designating it, designating these areas as a hotspot until uh, much later into the process. Um, that's not for us to declare if something is a hotspot or not. Um, so I, you know, can't really speculate more as to why they uh, use the term that they did. Even though your scientists were using that term in relation to these plants? I'm not aware of any of our scientists using the term hotspot. It's in emails that you sent us as part of a FOIA request. Uh, 
again, uh, you know, I'm not sure in what relation, what context those emails were sent uh, as far as uh, what, why they designated it a hotspot. Um, you know, like I said, we weren't aware of that term being used uh, to designate these areas um, until later used by EPA. So even though you had already were working to fulfill that FOIA request at that time, that you had sent out that press release, you weren't aware of that? Again, I believe EPA is, the term, is who designated the area as a hotspot. That was not our designation. So they did designate it as a hotspot? I believe they did, but I'm not exactly sure what the timeline was on calling it a hotspot. But it appears that's the complete opposite of what Fletcher wrote in the February 2022 press release claiming the DEP was not aware these areas were declared hotspots. If we check the timeline, we found those emails as far back as November 2019, from the DEP to the EPA and Union Carbine facilities, using the word hotspot multiple times. It took more than two months to get this interview with Terry Fletcher or anyone from the DEP, and we were finally able to ask the question, we've been getting from people like Kathy who live in these areas. Do you think it's safe for people to live around these plants? Um, you know, the, the, the cancer or the potential uh, lifetime cancer risk that EPA uh, has come out with uh, is, is based on a very conservative estimate um, of being exposed to uh, high levels of ETO uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, over 70 years. Um, you know, everyone has their own definition of what's an acceptable risk. Um, you know, our, our priority is to provide folks with the information they need um, and to uh, keep them informed, as well as keep, continue to work within the regulatory framework uh, to address any potential issues. Um, you know, as we stated earlier uh, to the crowd, there are many folks uh, in the DEP, uh, as well as that are here today uh, with our Division of Air Quality that live in these areas, uh, have lived here for a long time, uh, are raising families, have young children, um, and they don't feel there's any reason to be alarmed. Neighbors we spoke with say that while they're concerned, they appreciate the opportunity to hear directly from experts and officials. What have you been able to learn so far? Well, you know, I will just say that I was glad to see that, you know, they seem to be very forthcoming with information. Um, I think there were a lot of questions, at least that I had, in terms of risk um, for cancer for folks in our community and really trying to, you know, get a better evaluation of, you know, where we stood with regard to that. Since that public meeting, the EPA has released new updated data, data that puts this North Charleston area near one of those plants, again, among the highest in the country for cancer risk. In March, the EPA released a new assessment based on 2017 data using a new tool called Air Talk Screen. The results showed lower emissions and put the areas around both plants below that hotspot level. But the EPA admitted the data used for the South Charleston plant wasn't updated. And the reality, the cancer risk for those who live downwind in North Charleston could have been much higher. Now we have new 2018 data from the EPA confirming those risk suspicions. The new assessment on ETO admissions puts that North Charleston area highlighted in dark blue as having one of the highest cancer risks in the U.S. In fact, of the more than 75,000 areas the EPA says have some exposure to ETO admissions, you don't have to look far down the list to find North Charleston because it ranks near the top at number 21. We reached out to the EPA to learn more about the data and to ask questions about the risk to neighbors. This particular census tract in Kanawha County in the North Charleston area shows a risk of 117 from ETO. Does that put them in a hotspot category based on that 100 in a million threshold? It, where it puts it is at a level of concern for us. Um, the national level analysis makes a number of assumptions, sometimes very conservative assumptions. Um, we'd like to take a more localized approach approach, a more refined approach to better understand emissions, better understand risk, and then based on the results of that closer look, decide what type of state or federal regulatory action might be appropriate to reduce those emissions to protect the neighboring communities. At the state level, we also reached out to the DEP 
the agency responsible for working with the plants to reduce emissions and for notifying residents of the risk. Remember, WSAZ obtained emails from November 2019 between the EPA and the DEP about the cancer risk associated with the plants. But the agency waited nearly two years to send out a press release alerting the public. Now, the 2018 data was released by the EPA in August, showing North Charleston as over the 101 million cancer risk. So I reached out to the DEP, asking for an interview. Chief Communications Officer Terry Fletcher didn't answer. This is Terry Fletcher, Acting Communications Director for the West Virginia DEP or return my call. Hi Terry, this is Emily Bennett with WSAZ. So I followed up with an email. Fletcher eventually responded, telling me DEP Secretary Ward was unavailable, but not before the agency took time to update their website. At that time of my call last Tuesday, the DEP's ETO website stated, quote, all census tracts in West Virginia are under the 100 in a million cancer risk level. A few hours after I reached out, the DEP updated that section of the website, removing the line about the cancer risk. It now reads, quote, currently emissions data from 2017 and 2018 are available. Nowhere does it mention the new information of that elevated cancer risk in North Charleston. As for neighbors, they're worried. I have skepticism. If I got this stuff in the air and we're all breathing it, what, what's going to happen, you know? A concern I took to the EPA. People that have lived there, especially for a long time, what would you say to someone who lives in that area? What I would say is that we are concerned about the longer term exposure, and that is the problem that, that we are, are focused on here. Um, that's why it's so important that <clears throat> EPA moves as quickly as it can to update, uh, to strengthen its regulations to get these emissions down as soon as we can. The EPA says it plans to have the next round of AirTalk screen results out by the end of this year. We showed you earlier when we went to the governor about the issues, but he wouldn't stop and speak with us. I recently got the chance to sit down with him and finally got to ask why neighbors were kept in the dark for so long. The DEP didn't, they waited a year and a half to tell these people about the concerns. Do you think they should have let these people know and, and then let those people decide the risk for themselves? Well, Sarah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, really and truly. I do know, I do know this, that uh, what really, I mean, in, in, in all fairness, if in fact the danger is either non-existent or super, super minimal, maybe the DEP made exactly the right decision. If you'll just be really fair, you know, maybe if they would have alarmed everybody, you could have had, who knows what could have happened and everything. Maybe they made the right decision. I, and I'm not defending, I'm not gonna do that. I told you that and everything. But from the standpoint of, uh, I do have a lot, a lot of confidence in Harold Ward and his folks. I think they do a good job. A this good is job. on your all's radar and something. Yeah, sure, sure. They're going to, and, and really, at the end of the day, you know, if, if there's a problem there, I hope to goodness we'll step up right off the get-go and say, there's a real problem here. We've got to go right now. And I'll, I'll lead that charge, I'll promise you. We also know the DEP conducted some air monitoring of its own. They say the details of what they found will be released by early next year. Thank you so much for joining us for this special. We hope you have a great holiday weekend.